Today on The Daily Dose, Alice takes a trip. First published in 1865, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, now commonly shortened to Alice in Wonderland, was first conceived three years before publication, when Carroll and the Reverend Robinson Duckworth rode up the headwaters of the River Thames in a boat with three young girls, a day which Carroll remembered as the golden afternoon. Carroll, whose real name was Charles Dodson, was a professor of mathematics at Christ Church University at Oxford. And on that golden afternoon, Lorena, Edith, and Alice were the daughters of Christ Church University's vice chancellor, Henry Liddell. The boat ride began at Follybridge, Oxford, and ended up five miles away in the Oxfordshire village of Godstow. Along the way, Carol made up a story for the girls about a bored little girl named Alice who falls through a rabbit hole into a subterranean fantasy world populated by peculiar anthropomorphic creatures. All three girls became transfixed by the story, prompting Alice Liddell to ask that Carol write it all down for her. Since its first publication, Alice in Wonderland has risen in stature to become one of the best known and most popular works of English language fiction. While its narrative, structure, characters, and imagery have been enormously influential in popular culture and literature, especially the fantasy genre. The work has never fallen out of print and has been translated into at least 97 languages. Character allusions are manifold, including Alice Liddell as herself, while Carol is characterized as the dodo, because Dodson frequently stuttered when he spoke, which made him pronounce his last name as Dodo Dodson. Symbolism provides another rich landscape in the story, since most of the book's adventures may have been influenced by people, situations, and buildings in Oxford, and at Christ Church in particular. For example, the rabbit hole symbolized the actual stairs in the back of Christ Church's main hall, while a carving of a griffin and a rabbit were pulled directly from Ripon Cathedral, where Carol's father was a canon. The book also makes many references to mathematics, which at the time of publication made the book a scathing satire on new modern mathematics that was just emerging in the mid-19th century. And there you have it. Alice Takes a Trip. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Lucky Lindy, the first man to cross the pond. Born in Detroit in 1902, Charles Lindbergh took up flying at the tender age of 20. A year later, he bought a surplus World War I Curtis Jenny biplane and toured the country as a barnstorming stunt pilot. In 1924, he enrolled in the Army Air Service Flying School in Texas and graduated at the top of his class. He became an airmail pilot in 1926 and pioneered the route between St. Louis and Chicago. In 1926, French entrepreneur Raymond Orteg re-offered a prize of $25,000 to the first aviator or aviators to fly nonstop across the Atlantic from New York to Paris, a flight of some 3,600 miles over open water. In response, Lindbergh convinced the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce to front the cost of the flight, setting a budget of $15,000 in support of Lindbergh's objective. Ryan Airlines Corporation of San Diego volunteered to build the Spirit of St. Louis, which proved to be little more than a single-engine gas tank with wings. The main fuel tank was placed in front of the cockpit, which cut off Lindbergh's forward vision other than the addition of a periscope. To cut down on weight, all non-essential instruments were removed, including the radio, gas gauges, night flying lights, navigation equipment, and a parachute. Bad weather delayed Lindbergh's transatlantic attempt for nearly a week, but on May 20th, 1927, the spirit of St. Louis struggled to lift off from the muddy grass runway at Roosevelt Field, so overloaded with fuel that the plane barely cleared the telephone wires at the end of the runway. On May 21st, halfway across the pond, Lindbergh entered a fog bank as he struggled to stay awake, holding his eyelids open with his fingers He later confessed that he hallucinated about ghosts passing through the cockpit. After 24 hours of flying, he spotted fishing boats and knew he was close to land. He called down to them which way to Ireland, 
When he landed at Le Bourget Aerodrome in Paris, Charles Lindbergh became an international celebrity, strengthening the notion that one man with the right amount of daring and ingenuity could have an enormous impact on the world. President Calvin Coolidge dispatched a warship to bring the hero home. Upon his arrival in New York, Lucky Lindy was given a ticker tape parade before being presented with the Congressional Medal of Honor. And there you have it, Lucky Lindy, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, The Bonanza Kings. During the gold rush of 1849, only the most hardy of men crossed a rugged nation for untold riches waiting for them in California. When silver was discovered in current-day Virginia City, Nevada, only the hardiest of the 49ers made their way over the rugged terrain of the Sierra Nevada mountains in hope of striking it rich yet again. While Billy Ralston and his womanizing business partner William Sharon became the early dominant mine owners in the region, they would soon be unseated by four uneducated Irishmen who would collectively become known as the Bonanza Kings. While John Mackey and James Fair worked shoulder to shoulder with their miners, they partnered with San Francisco bartenders James Flood and William O'Brien, who opened their bar by pure chance next to the San Francisco Mining Exchange, where they captured insider knowledge about various silver mines when the traders came in for lunch. James Fair was the best miner of the group, and after the consolidated Virginia silver mine exhausted what was commonly thought to be its last ounce of silver, Fair was convinced that the true mother load of the Comstock lay much deeper than the Virginia City mine owners had plumbed. While Fair and Mackey started digging deeper in the mine, the bartenders quietly began buying up shares of Con Virginia stock as share prices plummeted from over $1,000 a share to under 50. Once the four Irishmen owned the lion's share of Con Virginia stock, they unearthed the largest single silver strike in world mining history, making the four immigrants some of the wealthiest men in the world. James Fair would go on to become a senator for the state of Nevada, unseating William Sharon as the two spent their millions to vie for power. Fair's wife would later divorce him on grounds of habitual adultery. He died at age 63, igniting a huge public scandal when his will mysteriously disappeared from the county clerk's office before any of the surviving children could read its contents. Soft-spoken and mild-mannered, William O'Brien became known as the Jolly Millionaire, freely confessing that he had neither taste nor talent for making money, prompting him to attribute his puzzling rise to affluence as an act of grasping onto rapidly ascending kites and simply holding on for dear life. After his death at age 52, a veritable conga line of women claimed to be the dead millionaire's wife, clogging the court system as they laid claims on his estate. James Flood would go on to build ever larger mansions around Northern California, including his Knob Hill home comprised of 42 rooms. Odd as it may seem, it was not the house itself that enthralled the citizens of San Francisco, but the block-long fence that surrounded the property. Known today as Flood's Brass Rail, its wealthy landlord employed a man full-time to polish the brass in much the same way that Flood had once maintained his rail at the auction lunch saloon. While John Mackey preferred a simple life in San Francisco, his socially climbing wife set up lavish homes in London and Paris. Marie Mackey solidified her entrance into Parisian society by hosting a party for Ulysses S. Grant while the ex-Civil War general was on his post-war world tour. To further her growing fame, Ludovic Halevi, a popular French novelist, published Le Abbé Constantine, a book about a fabulously rich American woman who tires of her life in Paris and moves to a rural mansion. The book became a mainstay for young Americans learning French, and the main character, Madame Scott, was clearly drawn from that of Marie Mackey. And there you have it, the Bonanza Kings, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Muhammad Ali. Born Cassius Clay on January 17, 1942, Muhammad Ali was an American professional boxer, activist, and philanthropist. Nicknamed the greatest, he was widely regarded as one of the most significant and celebrated sports figures of the 20th century, and one of the greatest boxers of all time. Born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, 
Ali began training as an amateur boxer at the tender age of 12. By the time he was 18, he won a gold medal in the light heavyweight division at the 1960 Summer Olympics, turning pro later that year. In 1964, 22-year-old Ali upset the 7-to-1 favorite Sonny Liston in a fight that stunned the boxing world. Just barely qualifying for the heavyweight division, Ali announced himself to the world as a first-rate trash talker in pre-fight interviews. If you want to lose your money, then bet on Sonny. There might be stop against that might be all, ladies and gentlemen. Get up there. Get up in the ring. Don't be rumble, float like a butterfly and sting like a beast. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Hey, that's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna. On April 28, 1967, citing his religious beliefs in opposition to the Vietnam War, Ali refused to be drafted into military service. He was arrested, found guilty of draft evasion, and stripped of his boxing titles. He spent the next five years in prison until he successfully appealed his case to the Supreme Court, which overturned his conviction in 1971. His refusal to fight an unjust war made him an icon of the counterculture generation opposed to the war in Southeast Asia. Muhammad Ali remains the only three-time lineal champion of the heavyweight division, beating 21 heavyweight boxers to cement his place into the history books of sports. In his later years, Ali developed Parkinson's disease and was hospitalized on June 2, 2016, with what was first diagnosed as a respiratory illness. Although his condition was initially described as survival, he died the next day at age 74 due to underlying complications relating to septic shock. And there you have it, the life and times of Muhammad Ali, today on The Daily Dose. Today in The Daily Dose, Martin Luther King Jr.'s final speech. On Wednesday, April 3rd, 1968, the community of Memphis, Tennessee spent the day under siege by strong winds and violent thunderstorms. After a bomb threat had delayed his flight from Atlanta, Martin Luther King Jr. and his contemporaries from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference checked in at the Lorraine Hotel in advance of a sanitation workers rally at the Mason Temple that night, followed by a planned protest march the following Monday. Doc, as he was affectionately known to his colleagues, checked into his usual room at the Lorraine, room 306, with his habitual roommate Ralph Abernathy at his side. Out on the rain-soaked streets, the Memphis police set up a dragnet around the hotel, doing what they could to protect the famed Nobel laureate and civil rights legend from untold threats by white racists intent on silencing MLK's message of nonviolent protest. Barely installed in room 306, two officers from the Memphis Sheriff's Department arrived to serve Dr. King with an injunction issued by the Fifth Circuit Court of Tennessee, indicating that next Monday's planned sanitation workers march had been banned. Combined with the bomb threat, Doc asked Abernathy and Jesse Jackson to stand in for him at the Mason Temple that night while he turned in early for some much needed sleep. Hours later, Doc awakened to the sound of his hotel room phone, and when he answered it, Abernathy informed him that the overcapacity crowd at the temple refused to take no for an answer regarding the morale-boosting speech by the civil rights legend. In response, Doc dressed in a suit and cabbed over to the church for what would become his final speech before his life was unjustly ended the following day. What we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. <laughs> But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read of the freedom of press, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. So just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, 
We aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The next day, stealing off with Abernathy for lunch at one of MLK's favorite fried catfish joints, Doc confessed to his friend that he hadn't prepared for last night's monumental speech, but rather he let the Holy Spirit guide his thoughts and words. Six hours later, while departing the Lorraine Hotel for a planned dinner at a local reverend's home, Doc received the worst injustice when an assassin's bullet found its mark. And there you have it, MLK's final speech and the passing of a civil rights icon today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Joseph McCarthy. During the early nervous days of the Cold War, Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy fueled the anti-communist Red Scare movement by alleging that numerous communist and Soviet sympathizers had infiltrated the federal government, universities, and the arts at large. After winning a U.S. Senate seat from his home state of Wisconsin, McCarthy's first three years in the Senate were undistinguished until he rose to national fame in 1950 when he asserted in his now infamous Enemies Within speech that he had a list of members of the Communist Party and members of a communist spy ring employed by the State Department. He would later broaden his finger pointing to include the administration of President Harry S. Truman, the Voice of America, political opponents, suspected homosexuals, and many A-list names in literature and Hollywood including Langston Hughes and Dorothy Parker, Charlie Chaplin, Orson Welles, Leonard Bernstein, Pete Seeger, Burl Ives, and Lena Horne. Known as McCarthyism, Joseph McCarthy used his seat on the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where some of McCarthy's most publicized Red Scare accusations took place. His downfall would come in the autumn of 1953, during the 36-day Army McCarthy hearings, when McCarthy's committee began its ill-fated inquiry into the Army Signal Corps laboratory at Fort Monmouth. Broadcasted via the Big Three news networks, public opinion began to see McCarthy as bullying, reckless, and dishonest, while many Republican lawmakers began to see McCarthy as a liability to the party. On the 30th day of the Army McCarthy hearing, after McCarthy challenged the Army's chief legal counsel, Joseph Nye Welch, to investigate a Boston lawyer named Fred Fisher, Welch had finally had enough of McCarthy's ruthless badgering and unfounded finger pointing. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left? No sense of On December 2, 1954, the Senate voted to censure and later condemn McCarthy in a 67 to 22 landslide vote. Among the charges against McCarthy was that he had used his committee authority 
as a lynching party, making the committee into an unwitting handmaiden and an involuntary agent and attorneys in fact of the Communist Party. Three years later, Joseph McCarthy would die from alcoholism at just 48 years of age. And there you have it, Joseph McCarthy, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the passing of FDR. Serving an unprecedented four terms in office, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had guided the American nation through the darkest days of the Great Depression, as well as through the majority of World War II. It is my resolve and yours to build up our armed defenses. On April 12, 1945, in what would become the final days of the war, FDR passed away at his retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia, leaving Vice President Harry S. Truman in charge of a nation deep in conflict. Roosevelt sat in his living room with his two cousins and Lucy Mercer, the later having resumed an extramarital affair with the president. While artist Elizabeth Shalmatov painted his portrait, at 1 p.m., the president suddenly complained of a terrific pain in the back of his head, collapsing moments later into an unconscious heap, the victim of a massive cerebral aneurysm. Back at the White House, after Eleanor Roosevelt was given the news, she met with Vice President Truman, who had not yet been told. A calm and collected Eleanor said, Harry, the president is dead, to which he replied, Is there anything I can do for you? Eleanor replied, Harry, is there anything we can do for you? For you are the one in trouble now. Overseas, American servicemen and women were made numb by the news, for the majority of the young fighters had known no other president for the entirety of their lives. As FDR's funeral train rolled across the southern countryside, people thronged for a last farewell to their wartime president. In Washington, D.C., FDR's mortal remains were paraded in honor to the Capitol where he was to lay in state. After the formal national ceremonies were over, he was buried in his hometown of Hyde Park, New York. Following the only four-term presidency in American history, Congress passed the 22nd Amendment, which limited a sitting president to no more than two terms. The amendment was passed on February 27, 1951. And there you have it, the passing of FDR, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Poor Richard's Almanac. Almanacs were wildly popular in colonial America, offering a mixture of seasonal weather forecasts, practical household hints, puzzles, and other amusements. At the age of 27, Franklin published his first Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, growing his brand in popularity for the next 25 years, primarily because of its extensive use of wordplay as well as some of the witty phrases coined in each year's edition, many of which have become a part of the American vernacular. Franklin adopted the pseudonym of Poor Richard for his fictional author Richard Saunders, and each of his yearly almanacs contained a calendar, weather forecasts, poems, sayings, as well as astronomical and astrological information, including the occasional mathematical exercise. Poor Richard's almanac is chiefly remembered, however, for being a repository of Franklin's many aphorisms and proverbs, many of which live on in American English today. No Pain, No Gain is a spin-off of Franklin's There Are No Gains Without Pains. Diligence is the mother of good luck. Keep thy shop, and thy shop will keep thee. Fools make feasts, and wise men eat them. To be humble to pride dines on vanity and sups on contempt. It is ill manners to silence a fool and cruelty to let him go on. The wise man draws more advantage from his enemies than the fool from his friends. He that lives upon hope will die fasting. Hear no ill of a friend, nor speak any of an enemy. Necessity never made a good bargain. Published without interruption from 1732 to 1758, Franklin's Almanac sold exceptionally well during its long print run reaching an annual printing of 10,000 copies a year, making Poor Richard's Almanac one of the first bestsellers in American history. And there you have it, Poor Richard's Almanac, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Hitler Wants a Wall. As early as December 1941, 
Nazi leader Adolf Hitler ordered that plans be drawn up for the construction of an Atlantic Wall, which would ultimately set off a monumental effort to create defensive fortifications along the entirety of the west coast of Europe. Work began in the spring of 1942, and by April of the following year, almost a quarter million conscripted French laborers were at work building massive coastal fortifications, batteries, mortars, and defensive masonry walls capable of stopping or at least slowing a mechanized invasion from the sea. From the tip of Norway to the Spanish border, every beach along nearly 2,000 miles of coastline was to be made impassable Naval guns were housed in what the Nazis believed to be indestructible bunkers, while behind the Atlantic Wall, tracks were laid for railway guns capable of hurling shells as far away as England. In the fall of 1943, Hitler became even more convinced that an Allied invasion along the Atlantic coast of Europe would soon become an inevitable reality. Known as the Desert Fox, Hitler ordered Rommel to undertake an inspection of the Atlantic Wall defenses and to prepare for what Hitler believed would be a decisive engagement between Allied and German forces. Believing also that the invasion would be launched across the Straits of Dover against the Pas de Calais region, Hitler ordered this sector to be given priority over other sectors of the Atlantic Wall construction project. But by mid-1944, while fortifications in and around the Pas de Calais region were deemed completed, other sectors were far from ready for an impending Allied invasion, particularly in and around Normandy, France. As a result of this defensive frailty, on June the 6th, 1944, the Allied invasion of Normandy took place at five beachheads known as Omaha, Juno, Utah, Gold, and Sword. Supported by 6,939 naval warships and landing craft, around 156,000 Allied soldiers and paratroopers landed on D-Day, while a total of a million and a half Allied troops would flood into Europe via the Normandy beachheads by the end of the week. 10,500 Allied troops would be killed, wounded, missing, or made prisoner of war by the end of the first day while the Germans would suffer a nearly equal number of casualties. Ten months later, Allied troops would storm the Nazi capital of Berlin, ending six years of bloodshed that cost the lives of 75 million people. And there you have it. Hitler wants a wall. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Hitler's Olympic Games. For two weeks in August 1936, Athletes descended upon Berlin for the 11th Olympic Games. Visitors and athletes alike were warmly welcomed, but behind the pomp and pageantry were ominous signs of a Nazi regime gone bad. The swastika was openly displayed on banners around town and at the Olympic Stadium, while the German sense of Aryan supremacy was a hard thing to conceal. After the aggressions displayed by the Germans during World War I, Hitler and his propaganda machine used the Olympics as a way to present a kinder, gentler image to a largely skeptical world. Off the field, the truth about what the Nazis were up to was hard for foreigners to miss. By 1936, Jews and other minorities had been openly stripped of their civil rights and even their citizenship, while Jewish-owned businesses were forced to display the Star of David on their storefronts. History would later reveal that the Nazis had already opened their first concentration camp by the time the Games began. Prior to the start of the Games, debate raged in the U.S. and other participating countries about whether to attend at all. But in the end, 49 nations, including the United States, came to Germany to compete. And at the opening ceremonies, Visiting athletes and spectators alike witnessed Aryan athletes follow in the footstep of ancient Greeks, bringing fire from Mount Olympus in the first ever Olympic torch relay. Popular history remembers Jesse Owens' four gold medals, an Olympic first for any athlete, no doubt causing great embarrassment to the Germans' belief in their Aryan supremacy. The Games also stood as a major corruption to the ideals sacred to the Olympic Games, creating an illusion of a peaceful and tolerant nation that was the farthest thing from the truth. Three years later, Nazi stormtroopers would blitzkrieg into Poland, 
setting off six years of war that would cost the lives of 60 million people. And there you have it, Hitler's Olympic Games, today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Catherine the Great. Born Sophie of Anhalt Zerbst on May the 2nd, 1729, Catherine the Great was Empress of Russia from 1762 until her death in 1796, giving her the distinction as Russia's longest ruling female leader. Coming to power following a coup d'etat that overthrew her husband, Tsar Peter III, under her reign, Russia grew from near third world obscurity to one of the greatest powers in all of Europe. Proving the age-old adage that an angry wife can be detrimental to a husband's health, Catherine's marriage to Tsar Peter III proved to be a raging disaster from the start. When Catherine became pregnant with her second child, Anna, due to various rumors of Catherine's promiscuity, Peter rejected his biological connection to the child, proclaiming that Anna should go to the devil. Catherine wrote in her diary that I used to say to myself that happiness and misery depend on ourselves, and to improve her sense of happiness, she conspired with other political opponents to Tsar Peter, leading to his assassination on July the 8th, 1762. While his assassins remain unclear, after an autopsy, Peter's official cause of death was labeled a severe attack of hemorrhoidal colic and an apoplexy stroke. Once in power, Catherine aligned herself with noble strongmen and generals alike, rapidly expanding the Russian Empire by conquest and diplomacy. In the south, the Crimean Khaganat was crushed following victories over the Ottoman Empire in the Russo-Turkish Wars followed by the colonization of the Novorossiya territories along the coast of the Black and Azov Seas. A great admirer of the Enlightenment and Peter the Great, Catherine continued to modernize Russia along Western European standards, including the foundation of the Smolny Institute for Noble Maidens, the first state-funded university-level institution for women in Europe, as well as the Moscow Orphanage for Disadvantaged Children and the Bolshoi Theater. She also established the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, sending out Soviets or art collectors to acquire famous works of art throughout Europe and the world. Today, the Hermitage represents the second largest art museum in the world, which celebrates its founding each year on December 7th with ceremonies known as St. Catherine's Day. Today in the Daily Dose, FDR and the New Deal. On March the 4th, 1933, during the bleakest days of the Great Depression, newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt delivered his first inaugural address before 100,000 people on Washington's Capitol Plaza. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is Fear itself. After assuring Americans that he would wage a war against the emergency, the following day, Roosevelt declared a four-day bank holiday to stop people from withdrawing their money from teetering banks. And on March the 9th, Congress passed Roosevelt's Emergency Banking Act, which reorganized the banks and closed the ones that remained hopelessly insolvent. In his first fireside chat, Roosevelt urged Americans to put their savings back into banks, and by the end of the month, almost three-quarters of all American banks had reopened their doors. During the first hundred days of Roosevelt's first term in office, FDR moved decisively to end prohibition by amendment to the U.S. Constitution, followed by the signing of the Tennessee Valley Authority Act, or TVA, which allowed the federal government to build dams along the Tennessee River for both flood control and the generation of inexpensive hydroelectric power. Simultaneously, Congress passed a bill that paid farmers to fallow their fields 
in order to end agricultural surpluses and boost food prices. The following month saw the enactment of the National Industrial Recovery Act, which guaranteed workers the right to unionize and negotiate for higher wages and better working conditions. Along with the passage of 12 other major laws, almost every American found something to be pleased about and something to complain about in FDR's robust collection of bills. But it was clear to everyone that FDR was engaging in the sort of direct and vigorous action he had promised in his inaugural address. Despite FDR's efforts to stimulate the economy, the Depression worsened with high unemployment and low wages, obliging Roosevelt to launch a second, more aggressive series of New Deal programs in the spring of 1935. Known as the Second New Deal, he created the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, providing federally funded jobs for the unemployed, which in turn improved the American infrastructure through the construction of post offices, bridges, schools, highways, and parks. Along with additional legislation to protect labor unions, in August of 1935, FDR signed the Social Security Act, which guaranteed pensions for working Americans, as well as unemployment insurance for workers laid off for reasons outside their own conduct or performance. Most historians concur that Roosevelt's New Deal era came to an abrupt end on December 8, 1941, when the United States entered World War II, just one day after the Japanese bombed American naval assets at Pearl Harbor. And there you have it, FDR and the New Deal, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Blue Baby Operation. On November 29, 1944, scores of Johns Hopkins surgeons and medical students crammed into the two-level observation gallery overlooking the Halstead Operating Room Theater. For the next four and a half hours, they looked on as surgeons performed the first Blue Baby Operation on a tiny and quite sickly 18-month-old named Eileen Saxon, who suffered from a condition known as Tetralogy of Fallot, which prevents blood from reaching the lungs for proper reoxygenation. The resultant congenital defect gives a distinctive blue cast to every part of the baby's body, and before the groundbreaking surgery taking place in the OR below, the congenital defect always resulted in death. The assembled team in the OR included lead surgeon Alfred Blaylock, a 1922 Johns Hopkins School of Medicine graduate, Blaylock's indispensable technician Vivian Thomas, chief surgical resident William Longmire, and 24-year-old surgical intern Denton Cooley, who would later go on to become one of the world's premier cardiac surgeons. Pediatric cardiologist Helen Tosig was also in the room, who together with Blaylock co-invented the shunt that hopefully would correct baby Saxon's lethal condition. Tosic had originally theorized that patients suffering from tetralogy of Fallot fail to have their patent ductus close off after a newborn starts to breathe on their own, which means their circulating blood fails to adequately reach the lungs. With their synthetic shunt in hand, Blaylock created an artificial ductus in baby Saxon by joining and shunting the patient's subclavian and pulmonary arteries. After the shunt was successfully sutured in place and the cross clamps removed from the shunted arteries, Dr. Tosic erupted in a litany of verbal excitement, exclaiming, Alfred Blaylock, you damn son of a bitch genius of a man, baby Eileen's pinking up like a glorious sunrise. While Blaylock was originally ridiculed by his colleagues for trying something far too brazen and untried, Michael Edenburn, Blue Baby patient number 44, attested to the technique's effectiveness when the 76-year-old businessman returned to Johns Hopkins for a visit, reporting that my doctors tell me my blood chemistry is that of a very healthy 25-year-old. Along with saving thousands of innocent young lives, Blaylock's pioneering procedure stands to this day as the precursor to modern cardiac surgery. And there you have it, 
the Blue Baby Procedure. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Amelia Earhart flies the pond. Born into a wealthy family in Atchison, Kansas, on July 24, 1897, Amelia Earhart developed a passion for adventure at an early age, steadily gaining flying experience from her 20s onward until her disappearance in 1937 during a Pacific Ocean flight from Ley, New Guinea to Howland Island. Nicknamed Lady Lindy after Charles Lindbergh's 1927 solo flight across the Atlantic, the following year, Earhart became the first woman to fly the Atlantic with pilot Wilmer Stoltz and co-pilot and flight mechanic Lewis Gordon. Departing from Trapassi Harbor, Newfoundland in a Falker F-7B, landing near Burryport, South Wales, 20 hours and 40 minutes later. Since most of the flight was on instruments and Earhart had no training yet for that type of flying, when asked by a reporter if she helped fly the plane, she answered, Stoltz did all the flying, had to. I was just baggage like a sack of potatoes. Maybe someday I'll try it alone. She did just that five years to the day after Lucky Lindy's flight across the pond, flying from Newfoundland to Ireland in just under 15 hours. On the morning of May 20th, 1932, 34-year-old Earhart set off from Harbor Grace with a copy of the Telegraph Journal newspaper given to her by a reporter to confirm the date of her flight in a Lockheed Vega 5B. After contending with strong northerly winds, icy conditions, and mechanical problems, Earhart landed in a pasture in Colmore, Northern Ireland. The landing was witnessed by Cecil King and T. Sawyers, and when a farmhand asked, have you flown far? Earhart replied, from America. And there you have it. Amelia Earhart flies the pond, today on The Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose, King Henry VIII of England. Considered by many historians to be one of the most charismatic and important rulers to ever sit on the English throne, Henry VIII is best known for his six marriages and numerous mistresses, including what would become a now infamous expulsion of the Holy Roman Catholic Church from England. After Pope Clement VII refused to annul Henry's first marriage to Catherine of Aragon, Henry separated the Church of England from papal authority, installing himself as the supreme head of the Church of England, while dissolving all convents and monasteries on English soil. Known for his radical changes to the English Constitution, Henry was most noted for ushering in the concept of the divine right of kings, a doctrine maintaining that kings derive their authority not from their subjects, but from the direct hand of God, Considered the father of the Royal Navy, Henry grew Britain's naval strength from a few semi-dedicated warships to well over 50, creating the Navy Board to oversee his burgeoning naval influence. Also on the home front, Henry oversaw the legal union of England and Wales, while becoming the first English monarch to rule as King of Ireland following the Crown of Ireland Act of 1542. He achieved many of his political aims through the work of his chief ministers, some of whom were banished or executed when they fell out of Henry's favor, including Thomas Wolsey, Thomas More, Thomas Cromwell, Richard Rich, and Thomas Cranmer. Known for his extravagant spending, Henry used the proceeds from the dissolution of convents and monasteries and money formerly paid to Rome to fuel his excessive lifestyle. Like many immoderate spenders, Henry was continuously on the brink of financial ruin, compounded by numerous and largely unsuccessful wars against King Francis I of France, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, King James V of Scotland, and the Scottish Regency under the Earl of Arran and Mary of Guise. Characterized in his later years as lustful, egotistical, paranoid, and tyrannical, Henry VIII died on January 28, 1547, after six contentious marriages, including Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, and Catherine Howard, not to mention a veritable conga line of mistresses along the way. 
And there you have it. Henry VIII executes ex-wives and chief councilmen. Today in the Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with the Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Thomas Edison sees the light. Thomas Edison was hardly the first to develop an incandescent light bulb, which was originally patented in England in 1841 by Frederick de Moline. In the ensuing four decades, however, a steady succession of inventors failed to produce a safe, bright, affordable bulb that could stay lit for more than a few minutes at a time. When 31-year-old Thomas Edison threw himself into the challenge of developing a commercially viable, durable light bulb, the serial inventor sought to develop not only a working bulb, but an entire lighting grid powered by a dedicated generator. Well-funded by the Edison Electric Light Company, Edison set to work inside his laboratory on his 34-acre research and development facility at Menlo Park, New Jersey. Together with a couple dozen young research assistants, the team succeeded in creating a vacuum tube with less than a one millionth concentration of air, which embodied the required conditions for a platinum filament to light successfully without catching fire. After a number of positive tests, Edison relegated his platinum filament to what he referred to as his cemetery of inventions, since the metal proved to be too costly for commercial exploitation. Turning to cheaper carbon filaments, Edison experimented with raw silk, cork, and even beard hairs procured from two of his staff members until on October 21, 1879, Edison and his team landed on a high-resistance carbon filament which burned continuously for more than 13 hours. Already hailed as the wizard of Menlo Park for his inventions of the phonograph, telegraph, and telephone, on New Year's Eve, 1879, Thomas Edison displayed an impressive string of some 25 light bulbs on his generator grid, which would soon radically transform a nation reliant upon tallow candles, kerosene, whale oil, and gas lights for night vision. Illumination sources, which blackened walls and furniture, reeked of sulfur and ammonia, and had a long pedigree of setting homes and businesses on fire. Of the visitors in attendance at Edison's New Year's Eve reveal, the only disappointed guests were the crestfallen representatives from the Brooklyn Gaslight Company, who, like everyone else in attendance, had just witnessed the dawn of the future. The fortunes would be reversed for the lucky stockholders of the Edison Electric Light Company, whose $100 initial public offering share price would soon explode to a high of $4,500 per share, which in today's money would cost an investor more than $115,000 for each and every share. And there you have it. Thomas Edison invents the incandescent light bulb. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, The Battle of Little Bighorn. Known by Plains Indians as the Battle of the Greasy Grass, the Battle of Little Bighorn was an armed engagement between combined forces of the Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho Indians against the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the United States Army. Part of the Great Sioux War of 1876, the battle took place along the Little Bighorn River within the Crow Indian Reservation of the Montana Territory. On June 26, the ensuing battle would prove to be an overwhelming victory for the Indians, as well as what would become known as Custer's Last Stand. Setting out on a spring campaign to engage the Indians anywhere they could be found, Colonel John Gibbon's six companies left Fort Ellis in western Montana Territory on March 30th, intending to patrol the Yellowstone River. Brigadier General George Crook's 10 companies moved north from Fort Fetterman in the Wyoming Territory on May 29th, marching toward the Powder River area, while Brigadier General Alfred Terry's 12 companies departed westward from Fort Abraham Lincoln in the Dakota Territory. Lieutenant Colonel George Custer's 12 companies and a Gatling gun detachment departed westward from Fort Abraham Lincoln on May 17th accompanied by Teamsters and Packers with 150 wagons and a large contingent of pack mules. 
At sunrise on June 25th, Custer's scouts reported a massive pony herd near the Little Bighorn River, along with signs of an Indian village, not wanting the Indians to flee before a fight. On the morning of June 26, Custer decided to attack without waiting for reinforcements. With an impending sense of doom, Custer's Crow Indian scout Half Yellowface prophetically warned Custer that you and I are going home today by a road we do not know. Expecting only around 800 belligerent warriors, Major Marcus Reno was first to attack the village until his line was overrun by upwards of 2,000 warriors led by Crazy Horse and Chief Gall. 29 troopers were killed during the retreat, while another 15 men went missing. As for Custer's bad day, the precise details are largely conjectural, since none of the American combatants would survive. Later pieced together by Indian accounts, Custer's force of 210 men had been engaged by the Lakota in northern Cheyenne, about three and a half miles to the north of Reno's fallback position. After the battle was over, troops came to recover the bodies, discovering that the dead soldiers had been stripped of their clothing and ritually mutilated. The dead were hastily buried where they fell, while Custer's body was discovered with two gunshot wounds, one to his left chest and the other to his left temple. Some Lakota oral histories assert that Custer committed suicide to avoid capture and subsequent torture, though this is usually discounted by historians since the wounds were inconsistent with his known right-handedness. And there you have it, the Battle of Little Bighorn, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the magician of San Francisco. After honing his piloting skills on the Mississippi River, William Chapman Ralston arrived into San Francisco five years after the start of the California Gold Rush, discovering an instant boomtown lacking infrastructure, lawfulness, and stable commerce. Ambitious and genial by nature, Billy Ralston became a partner in a growing steamship line, using his profits to join forces with his womanizing Gilded Age business partner, William Sharon. Together, Ralston and Sharon made immense fortunes in the Virginia City Comstock Silver Rush, infusing their millions into California-based companies created and managed by Ralston himself. He also started the Bank of California, which ultimately grew into the largest banking institution west of St. Louis which in turn prompted San Franciscans to nickname the dashing socialite the Magician of San Francisco. Known for throwing lavish parties at his Snob Hill mansion or his 55,000 square foot summer mansion in Belmont, the press soon coined these socialite gatherings Ralston Nights, both for the celebrities in attendance and the outrageous extravagance of each event. A robust strapping man Billy Ralston swam in the icy waters of San Francisco Bay on a near-daily basis, and when the Big Four ran low on money while laying tracks through the slow and treacherous Sierra Nevada mountains, Ralston loaned Leyland Stanford $100,000, nearly $2 million in today's currency, to tide the Big Four over to the next federal payout for their part in the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. In return, Stanford promised Ralston that no competitive goods would enter Western markets upon the completion of the cross-country railroad. And when Stanford ultimately reneged on that promise, combined with his own financial overreach, Ralston's many companies collapsed under competitive pressures from back east. Ralston's fall from magician status became complete when a run on his Bank of California forced the bank to suspend. The next day, after his board of directors forced his resignation, Ralston signed all his assets over to William Sharon, who would later settle Ralston's debts for a greed-inspired profit of many millions of dollars. Departing his once grand bank on an unusually hot day on August 27, 1875, Ralston ran into his physician on the street, who told the fallen tycoon that he looked unusually pale and sweaty. Feeling oddly elated, like a schoolboy released for the summer, Ralston waved off his doctor's concerns, heading to his swim club, where he swam out toward Alcatraz Island and drowned. 
News of his death sent shockwaves throughout the West Coast, while many, including Sharon himself, believed that Ralston's death was a suicide. So beloved by San Franciscans for all his many achievements, in 1941, 66 years after his passing, the people of San Francisco erected an obelisk in his memory. And there you have it, Billy Ralston, the magician of San Francisco, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the prophecies of Nostradamus. While most academics dismiss the prophecies of Nostradamus as intentional mistranslations of his 1555 publication of Les Prophéties, others have found his prophecies regarding future events to be numbingly close to the truth. A physician and astrologer by trade, his book of 942 poetic quatrains has long captivated the world. For instance, one of his prophecies regarding 9-11 reads, Earth-shaking fire from the center of the earth shall cause tremors around the new city. Two great rocks will war for a long time. Then Arethusa will redden a new river. Another of his poems relating to 9-11 reads, Two steel birds shall fall from the sky on the metropolis. The sky will burn at 40 degrees latitude, which in truth turns out to be the exact latitude for New York City. Among Nostradamus' most talked about prophecies include the Great London Fire of 1666, the French Revolution, the rise of both Napoleon Bonaparte and later Adolf Hitler, the Apollo moon landings, and the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. He also prophesied the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, both World War I and World War II, and the nuclear destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. While academics insist that the prophecies of Nostradamus are little more than retroactive clairvoyant interpretations of his quatrains, plenty others maintain that Nostradamus was and remains one of the most gifted seers of all time. And there you have it. The Prophecies of Nostradamus, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, The Life and Works of Thomas Paine. Historian Saul K. Padover described Thomas Paine as a corset maker by trade, a journalist by profession, and a propagandist by inclination, which quite adequately sums up the life and work of a man deeply ensconced in political activism and the Enlightenment-era ideals of transnational human rights. Born in Thetford, England in 1736, Thomas Paine migrated to the American colonies at the age of 38 with the help of Benjamin Franklin, arriving just in time to fuel the fires of the American Revolution. Almost every colonialist rebel read or listened to his powerful dissertation entitled Common Sense, which was by far the best-selling pamphlet in all of the colonies. Common sense was so influential to the American Revolution that John Adams said of the work, without the pen of the author of Common Sense, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. Paine's next successful work was a series of pamphlets known collectively as the American Crisis, which further inflamed pro-revolutionary sentiment in the colonies. After successfully assisting independence in America, Paine moved to France for most of the 1790s, where he became a leading proponent in the French Revolution. After penning the rights of man in 1791, in defense of the French Revolution against its critics, his attacks on Anglo-Irish conservative writer Edmund Burke led to a trial and conviction in absentia in England for the crime of seditious libel. Worried by the possibility that the French Revolution might well spread into England, the British government of William Pitt the Younger attempted to suppress Paine's philosophies, which advocated the right of citizens to overthrow their governments. In 1792, England issued a writ for his arrest, which forced Paine to flee to France permanently in September of that same year. Despite his inability to speak the French language, he was quickly elected to the French National Convention. Deemed an enemy of France by the ruling authorities in the country, 
the Montagnard, led by Maximilien Robespierre, in December of 1793. Paine was arrested and taken to Luxembourg prison in Paris, where he continued to write The Age of Reason, which challenged institutionalized Christian dogma and the legitimacy of the Bible. After future U.S. President James Monroe used his diplomatic connections to secure Paine's release from prison, Paine published Agrarian Justice in 1797, which challenged the origins and legitimacy of property rights and introduced the concept of a guaranteed minimum income through a one-time inheritance tax on landowners. He returned to the U.S. in 1802, and upon his death seven years later, only six people attended his funeral due to his staunch ridicule of the Christian faith. And there you have it, the life and works of Thomas Paine, today on A Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. After years of economic decline and a rising awareness by average Joe Russians that the Soviet political elites ate caviar in their dakas while average Joe stood hungry in food lines, the Soviet Union's ironclad grip over her citizens began to crumble by the late 1980s. Fully aware of the failing state of the Soviet economy, in 1985, General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev began to usher in reforms that would move his nation from strict Marxist-Leninist communism to social democracy. Sensing change in the Soviet's core ideology after 40 years of budget-draining Cold War, U.S. President Ronald Reagan called out Gorbachev during a 1987 speech near the Berlin Wall that divided communist East Berlin from democratic West Berlin. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of this city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Two years later, on the 9th of November 1987, East German politician Gunther Schabowski inadvertently triggered the fall of the Berlin Wall when at a live press conference he read a draft bill just passed by the East German government which eased restrictions on the rights of citizens to immigrate to the West. When asked by reporters when these more lenient measures would take effect, Schabowski answered immediately. Known by Germans as Der Mauer, when the news broke, people amassed on both sides of the Berlin Wall, celebrating the end of their divided city for the first time in 26 years. Early breach attempts to the wall met with only mild resistance from border guards, which ushered in a full reunion as people freely crossed through Checkpoint Charlie. The following morning, after Berliners had chipped away at the wall for souvenirs, the wall came down in earnest when excavators were brought in to officially bring the wall to its highly anticipated end. And there you have it, Ronald Reagan's landmark speech, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Vivaldi and the Figli del Coro. No matter where a traveler to 17th century Venice turned an ear, they could hear music pouring out of churches and buildings both night and day. Composers of the day seized on the skills of virtuoso singers and musicians, creating solos that pushed the boundaries of the best player's abilities. Venetian composer Antonio Vivaldi, known as Il Prete Rosso, or the Red Priest for his flaming red hair, became the form's undisputed leader. Vivaldi's creativity was facilitated by a particular group of musicians who could learn new music quickly on a staggering array of instruments. 
drawing acclaim from emperors, priests, and princes, they were the all-female cast of orphans known as the Figli del Coro, or Daughters of the Choir. Only in Venice, a prominent visitor wrote, can one see these musical prodigies. They sing like angels, play the violin, the flute, the organ, the oboe, the cello. In short, no instrument is large enough to frighten them. An expense report that Vivaldi recorded in 1712 indicates that he spent 20 ducas on a violin for 16-year-old Anna Maria, who was the best of all the figli, and an expenditure that equaled four months of Vivaldi's income. The fact that the women figli sang and played behind thin crepe curtains drove many to frustration, including rebel philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who confessed that he was driven to despair and when he finally got an audience with the Figli, he was horrified by their general deformity and disfigurement. There was Sophia, he wrote, who was horrid, while Catina had but one eye. Bettina was entirely disfigured by smallpox, while scarcely one of the Figli was without some striking defect. The girls and women who delighted delicate ears had not lived delicate lives. Many of their mothers worked in Venice's vibrant sex industry, who then passed their syphilis diseases onto their babies when they were dropped off at the Ospitale della Pierta, or Hospital of Pity, where the girls subsequently grew up and mastered music. After the plague of 1630 that wiped out one-third of the Italian population, Venetians found themselves in a penitential mood, as one historian put it, and when the Ospitali governors saw a rise in church attendance and donations because of the girls' musical skills, the Figli del Coro skyrocketed to fame. And there you have it, Vivaldi and the Figli del Coro, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Kit Carson, a trailblazer to the American West. Born in December of 1809, Kit Carson left his Missouri home at the tender age of 16, becoming a mountain man and fur trapper in the untamed American West. In the 1830s, he accompanied Ewing Young on an expedition into Mexican California before heading into the Rocky Mountains on repeated fur trapping expeditions, where he lived among and married into the Arapaho and Cheyenne tribes. In the 1840s, Carson achieved national fame when he was hired as a guide by John Fremont, who mapped the Oregon Trail to assist and encourage pioneers on their journey west. Under Fremont's command, Carson participated in the conquest of California from Mexico at the beginning of the Mexican-American War, again rising to national acclaim when he walked 15 miles barefoot to fetch reinforcements from San Diego after the disastrous Battle of San Pasqual. During the 1850s, Carson was appointed as an Indian agent to the Ute and Jacarillo Apaches. And when the Civil War broke out, he helped eliminate a Confederate threat in New Mexico. Carson also led forces during the Indian Wars, suppressing the Navajo, Mescalero Apache, Kiowa, and Comanche tribes by destroying their food sources. Later, he was breveted a brigadier general and took command of Fort Garland, Colorado, until declining health forced him to retire from military life. After his death in 1868 from an aortic aneurysm, during the late 19th century, Kit Carson became a legendary symbol of America's frontier experience after he was canonized in countless dime store novels and Hollywood movies. In more recent years, Carson has also become a symbol of the American nation's gross mistreatment of its indigenous peoples. And there you have it, Kit Carson and the American Frontier, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. Born in the village of Klushino near Gazask, a city that would later bear his name, Yuri Gagarin flew for the Soviet Air Forces before being selected along with five other cosmonauts for the Soviet space program. As the Cold War and subsequent space race escalated between the United States and the USSR, 
Gagarin would stun the world by beating the Americans into space. On April 12, 1961, Gagarin boarded his Vostok 1 space capsule for a successful liftoff. He orbited the Earth for 108 minutes before re-entering Earth's atmosphere, ejecting from his capsule at 23,000 feet for a parachute drop safely down to Earth. Gagarin became an instant national hero and was awarded the Soviet Union's highest medal for valor. Beginning in 1962, the Soviet Union began celebrating the day of Gagarin's flight as Cosmonautics Day, which was later renamed International Day of Human Spaceflight. The flight would be his sole trip into space, although he did serve as backup crew for the ill-fated Soyuz 1 spaceflight, which ended in a fatal crash, killing his friend and fellow cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. Fearing for the life of their national hero, Soviet officials permanently banned Gagarin from further spaceflights. He died in 1968 when his MiG-15 training jet crashed near the town of Kurtzak, taking the life of Gagarin and flight instructor Vladimir Zorogin. And there you have it, Yuri Gagarin, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the 13 virtues of Ben Franklin. Through an extensive study of the world's major religions and various moral codes, Founding Father Ben Franklin came up with a list of 13 main virtues to which he felt that everyone should strive to live by. Once established, Franklin dedicated himself to building up these virtues in himself, developing self-editing charts to record his daily progress, ensuring that his results were always one of upward improvement. Once he had mastered a given virtue, he then moved on to focus on the next in line in his ongoing push for self-excellence. Franklin's first virtue was temperance, where he proclaimed, eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. Although in his later years, Franklin became quite a prodigious consumer of alcohol. His second virtue was silence, where he advised, speak not but what may benefit others or yourself, and avoid trifling conversations. Third was order, so that all a person's belongings had their rightful place and each part of one's business had its time. Fourth was resolution, where he encouraged people to perform without fail whatever that person resolved to do. Fifth was frugality, which suggested that a person should make no expense but to do good to others. While sixth was industry, where people should lose no time and always be employed in something useful. Seven was sincerity without hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly, he wrote, and if you speak, speak accordingly. Eight was justice, where he encouraged his colonial brethren to wrong no other man, while nine was moderation in all things, and ten was cleanliness, both in body, clothing, and home. Tranquility made up his number eleven, where he encouraged readers to be not disturbed by trifles or by accidents common or unavoidable. Chastity made up his number 12, where he wrote to rarely use sex but for health or offspring, while Franklin's last virtue was humility, where he encouraged people to imitate Jesus and Socrates. And there you have it, the 13 virtues of Ben Franklin, today on The Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Alexander Fleming discovers penicillin. Perhaps one of the most significant scientific discoveries in modern medicine, in 1928, Scottish-born physician and scientist Alexander Fleming began a series of experiments involving common staphylococcal bacteria. When an uncovered petri dish sitting near an open window became contaminated with mold spores, Fleming noted that the Staphylococcus clusters in direct proximity to the mold colonies were dying, as evidenced by the dissolving and clearing of the surrounding auger gel. Fleming went on to identify the mold as a member of the Penicillium genus, further discovering that his accidental mold contaminant was extremely effective against all gram-positive pathogens, which were known to be responsible for diseases such as yellow fever, pneumonia, gonorrhea, meningitis, and diphtheria. He further discerned that it was not the mold itself that did the killing, but some juice the mold produced that had killed the surrounding bacteria. 
When I woke up just after sunrise on September 28, 1928, he would later recall, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic or a bacteria killer. But I suppose that's exactly what I did. Although Fleming published his discovery of penicillin in the British Journal of Experimental Pathology in 1929, the scientific community greeted his work with little enthusiasm. While Fleming had difficulty isolating his mold juice, in 1940, scientists Howard Florey and Ernst Chain began mass-producing penicillin fortuitously near the start of World War II. Fleming would receive many awards for his discovery, including the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1945. And there you have it. Alexander Fleming discovers penicillin today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Ernie Pyle, America's eyewitness to war. Unquestionably the most famous and beloved American war correspondent of World War II, Ernie Pyle's distinctive folksy writing style brought the horrors of war into living rooms throughout the United States. Embedded with frontline troops in the European theater of operations from 1942 to 1944, Pyle wrote about ordinary dog-faced infantry soldiers, which he called the underdogs of World War II. Through his heroic reporting, Pyle became friends with enlisted men and officers alike, as well as war leaders such as Omar Bradley and Dwight D. Eisenhower. After returning stateside to shake off a severe case of battle fatigue, Pyle returned to the trenches in 1945, this time in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Reinforcing his status as the dog-faced GI's best friend, Pyle wrote a column from Italy in 1944, proposing that soldiers in combat should get fight pay, just as airmen receive flight pay. In May 1944, Congress passed a law that became known as the Ernie Pyle Bill, authorizing 50% extra pay for combat service. Syndicated in over 400 daily and 300 weekly newspapers, his most famous column was the death of Captain Waskow when he was reporting from Anzio during the invasion of Italy. I don't know who that first dead man was, he wrote. You feel small in the presence of dead men and ashamed at being alive and you don't ask silly questions. He further wrote, that as dead soldiers were brought down a mountain from the front lines, one of them that was laid out in the dim moonlight was much beloved Captain Henry Waskow of the 36th Infantry Division. Pyle wrote, Then a soldier came and stood beside the officer and bent over, and he too spoke to the dead captain, not in a whisper but awfully tenderly, and he said, I sure am sorry, sir. Then the first man squatted down and he reached down and took the dead man's hand, and he sat there for a full five minutes, holding the dead hand in his own and looking intently into the dead face, and he never uttered a sound all the time he sat there. And finally he put the hand down, and then he reached up and gently straightened the points of the captain's shirt collar, and then he sort of rearranged the tattered edges of the uniform around the wound. And then he got up and walked away down the road in the moonlight, all alone. When Pyle was killed during the Battle of Okinawa, April 14, 1945, President Harry S. Truman said of the gutsy reporter, no man in this war has so well told the story of the American fighting man as American fighting men wanted it told. He deserves the gratitude of all his countrymen. Pyle's wife, Jerry, would die later that same year from complications of influenza. And there you have it, Ernie Pyle, America's eyewitness to war. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. On April 9, 1865, after four years of bloody warfare that cost the lives of 620,000 Americans, Confederate General-in-Chief Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia officially surrendered to the Union Army of the Potomac under the commanding general of the United States. The surrender took place at the McLean House in Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, after one of the final battles of the Civil War. Less than a week later, the American nation would shudder at the loss of one of its most historic and impactful leaders. On April 14, 1865, after a long day tending to the nation's business, 
The 16th American president and his wife Mary went to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. to take in the wildly popular stage play comedy, Our American Cousin. Due to his national fame as a stage actor, Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth maintained ready access to all parts of Ford's Theater, using his carte blanche access for the planned assassination of President Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William H. Seward. While Booth's co-conspirator Lewis Powell was tasked with killing Seward, George Atzerod was tasked with killing the Vice President. Arriving late to the theater with Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée, Clara Harris, the play was interrupted so that the orchestra could play Hail to the Chief as the packed house of some 1,700 theatergoers rose in applause. As the play resumed, Booth, who knew the play by heart, entered the Lincoln skybox from behind, timing his lone shot to coincide with one of the funniest lines of the play. As laughter pealed throughout the theater, Booth approached the president and shot him in the back of the head with a six-inch single-shot Derringer. The bullet entered Lincoln's skull behind his left ear, passed through his brain, and came to rest near the front of his skull, fracturing both his orbital plates. Major Rathbone jumped from his seat and struggled with Booth, who dropped his Derringer and drew a knife, stabbing Rathbone in his left forearm. Rathbone again grabbed at Booth, just as the assassin jumped from the skybox to the stage, a 12-foot drop, but not before one of his spurs became entangled with the treasury flag decorating the Lincoln skybox. Booth's fall to the stage was a painful one, landing him awkwardly on his left foot. But as he began to cross the stage, many in the audience thought he was part of the play and began to laugh. Before Booth fled into the night, most eyewitness accounts indicate that Booth held up his bloody knife and yelled, Sic Semper Tyrannis, which is Latin for thus always to tyrants. With the help of three doctors in attendance that night, the comatose president was moved across the street to a first floor bedroom in Taylor William Peterson's house. More physicians arrived to offer aid, but the 16th president of the United States left this earth the following day at 7.22 in the morning. Lincoln's death was mourned around the world. Hundreds of thousands attended his funeral procession through the streets of Washington, D.C. on April 19th, followed by a 1,700-mile train ride procession from New York to Lincoln's hometown of Springfield, Illinois, often passing trackside tributes in the form of bands, bonfires, and hymn singing. The hunt for the conspirators quickly became the largest in U.S. history, involving thousands of federal troops and countless civilians. Booth was cornered by the 16th New York Cavalry while the assassin was sleeping in a barn in Virginia. A lone soldier snuck up behind him and shot Booth in the back of the head, a just reprisal for what the assassin had done to the President of the United States. Many of Booth's co-conspirators were freed after lengthy trials, while Mary Surratt, Lewis Powell, David Harold, and George Atzerod were hanged by the neck on June 30th, 1865. And there you have it, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the assassination of President McKinley. Elected president in 1896 against Democratic rival William Jennings Bryan, William McKinley successfully led the nation back to prosperity after the Panic of 1893, as well as leading the military to victory in the Spanish-American War, which saw the Spanish colonies of Puerto Rico and the Philippines handed over to the United States. Re-elected handily in a rematch against Bryan in 1900, McKinley was poised for another four years of high popularity, along with his second-term vice president, Theodore Roosevelt. Despite the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln in 1865 and James Garfield in 1881, McKinley frequently chose to sideline his security detail so that the president could mingle with the American people any chance he could get. During a long trip scheduled for the months following his second inauguration, McKinley scheduled major speeches intending to promote his plan for more protective tariffs on foreign goods, culminating with a speech at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. When McKinley's wife Ida became gravely ill on a cross-country train trip, McKinley postponed his visit to the exposition, 
finally making his way to Buffalo on September 5, 1901. On September 5th, while McKinley and his wife disembarked their private car at the Buffalo train station, anarchist George Chogas made his first secretive attempt on the president's life, but finding McKinley too well guarded, he dropped back for a second attempt on September 6. An immigrant from Poland, Chalgas regarded McKinley as a symbol of wealth and oppression over the working man. And when McKinley reached to shake Chalgas's hand in the reception line at the exposition, Chalgas shot the president twice in the abdomen with a concealed pistol he kept wrapped in a linen napkin. In the days following his injuries, McKinley appeared to be recovering. However, he died of gangrene on September 14th, making him the third sitting American president to lose his life to an assassin's bullet. After Chalgas was executed by means of electrocution, in 1906, Congress passed legislation designating the Secret Service as the agency in charge of all future presidential security. And there you have it, the assassination of President McKinley, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Virginia Woolf's seminal novel, Orlando. First published in October 1928, Virginia Woolf's Orlando is a high-spirited romp inspired by the tumultuous family history of the aristocratic poet, novelist, and Woolf's lesbian lover, Vita Sackville West. The book follows the adventures of a poet who changes sex from a man to a woman and lives for centuries without aging, along the way meeting key figures in English literary history. Since its publication, the book has become a feminist mainstay and has been extensively written about by scholars of women's writing and transgender studies. A member of the artistic and intellectual guild known as the Bloomsbury Group, which included fiction writer E.M. Forster and economist John Maynard Keynes, the group's combined works profoundly influenced literature, aesthetics, criticism, and economics, as well as modern attitudes toward feminism, pacifism, and sexuality. In Woolf's novel specifically, the work also satirized British culture in the sense that inversion, as lesbianism was then called, was allowed only as a fictional allegory, but never touched upon in British society if inversion was deemed real. Woolf also intended the novel as compensation for the sense of loss often felt by Sackville West when she lost her childhood home to a male cousin simply because he was male and she was female. Scholars have further argued that the novel is about the impossibility of representing the female experience in its entirety, particularly when the observing comes from the eyes and thinking of a male perspective. And there you have it, Virginia Woolf's seminal work, Orlando, today on The Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Alan Shepard, the first American in space. A graduate of the Naval Academy at Annapolis, Alan Shepard saw action in the Navy during World War II, becoming a naval aviator in 1946 and a test pilot in 1950. Selected as one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts in 1959, Shepard proved to be the definition of the right stuff when he piloted his Mercury Redstone 3 rocket into space on May 5, 1961. Before ascending up to the capsule, Shepard paused to admire his massive rocket, later recalling that he suddenly realized he would never see the beast again. Flight delays rolled on for more than four hours until he finally asked for a bathroom break. Denied by the flight director, Shepard was encouraged by ground personnel to simply let it go. He later recalled that he was completely dry by liftoff due to the wicking nature of his cotton undergarments and the capsule's environment of 100% oxygen. Named Freedom 7 by Shepard himself, his 15-minute flight would take him 150 miles up into space where he was able to fully control the pitch, roll, and yaw of his spacecraft. Upon his return to Earth, Shepard became an instant national celebrity, flying into space a mere three weeks after Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. 
Designated as the commander of the first crewed Gemini flight, he was grounded in 1963 due to Meniere's disease, an inner ear condition that causes extreme bouts of dizziness and nausea. After the ailment was surgically corrected in 1969, Shepard commanded Apollo 14, becoming the fifth and oldest man to walk on the moon. One of the crew had smuggled the head of a six iron in one of their utility pockets of their spacesuits, and when Shepard attached the head to a shaft-like piece of the lunar lander, he took four one-handed swings on the moon due to the restrictive nature of the spacesuit. While the record for the longest golf shot on Earth is held by Mike Austin at 515 yards, when Shepard finally connected on his final shot, it is estimated that the ball traveled upwards of one mile, or 1,760 yards, through the moon's reduced gravitational pull. On the moon, anyway. We're gonna need a bigger course. And there you have it, Alan Shepard, the first American in space, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Robert Wadlow, the tallest man on Earth. Born in Alton, Illinois on February 22nd, 1918, Robert Pershing Wadlow would grow up to suffer from a pituitary condition that caused him to grow ceaselessly because of a continuous overproduction of growth hormone. A shy and cheerful lad, Robert Wadlow surpassed his father's six-foot height by age eight, topping out at six feet 11 by age 12, while reaching a height of eight feet four inches by the time he graduated high school in 1936. At his tallest eminence, his shoe size clocked in at 40. Wherever Robert went, he attracted cameras and crowds and after high school, he took a job as a field representative for St. Louis's International Shoe Company, traveling from town to town and shoe store to shoe store, where people flocked for a look at the world's tallest man. Except for a short stint with the Barnum and Bailey Circus, where he objected at being thrown in with the circus's freak show crowd, Robert Wadlow never felt sorry or ashamed about his condition. In fact, he said that people should utilize their handicaps instead of fussing about them. Look at me, he went on to say. I'm nearly nine feet tall and I'm getting along all right. On the 4th of July, 1940, during a professional appearance at the Manistee National Forest Festival in the lower peninsula of Michigan, a faulty leg brace irritated his ankle, leading to a septic infection. He was treated with a blood transfusion and surgery, but his condition worsened due to an autoimmune disorder, and he died in his sleep on July 15th at the tender age of 22. His coffin measured 10 feet 9 inches in length and weighed in at over a thousand pounds, requiring 12 pallbearers and 8 assistants to carry the giant to his final resting place at Oakwood Cemetery, Alton, Illinois. Today, Robert Wadlow's pituitary condition remains 100% preventable. And there you have it, Robert Wadlow, the tallest man on earth, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the resignation of Richard Milhouse Nixon. Born into a poor family in Southern California, Richard Nixon would go on to graduate from Duke University School of Law followed by a succession of political offices, including congressman and later senator from California, followed by eight years as vice president under President Dwight D. Eisenhower, elected into office as the 37th president in 1969. Nixon's five-year presidency saw the conclusion of U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, detente with the Soviet Union and China, and the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as presiding over the Apollo 11 moon landing. During his second term in office, Nixon's presidency would disintegrate under the Watergate scandal, which stemmed from the Nixon administration's repeated attempts to cover up its involvement in the failed break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate office complex in Washington, D.C. After the five break-in perpetrators were arrested, Two reporters from the Washington Post and the U.S. Justice Department connected the cash found on the men at the time of the break-in to Nixon's re-election campaign committee, a clear violation of campaign funding law. During his resultant impeachment hearings in the House of Representatives, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Nixon was mandated to release his Oval Office tapes to government investigators. 
which would later reveal Nixon's direct attempts to cover up activities that took place after the Watergate break-in, while attempting to use federal officials to derail the investigation against him. On August 9, 1974, in the face of almost certain impeachment and removal from office, Richard Nixon became the only sitting president to resign from office. We leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you've done. We want you to continue to serve in government if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never get discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you. But those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Just think how much you're going to be messy. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. And there you have it, the resignation of Richard Milhouse Nixon, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the expensive flight of the Spruce Goose. During World War II, German U-boats wreaked havoc on Allied convoys as they ferried men and war material into the battlegrounds of Europe. As a result of these heavy losses, the U.S. government signed a contract with Hughes Aircraft Company to build a massive float plane that could carry 750 troops or two 30-ton M4 Sherman tanks over the Atlantic. The man contracted by the U.S. Department of Defense to design and build the H-4 Hercules was a larger-than-life figure named Howard Hughes, who was a pilot, plane maker, and film producer. While the contract was signed in November 1942, it wasn't until 1944 before construction began, almost a year after the U-boat threat had been largely eradicated and the plane no longer needed. Built entirely of wood due to wartime shortages of aluminum, Washington finally had enough and canceled the project, but Hughes's vigorous lobbying campaign reached an agreement with lawmakers that one airplane could be completed Two years later, parts of the massive plane were moved to an assembly site near Long Beach Harbor, where more delays in final assembly caused more rumblings in Washington. After the construction project had swallowed vast sums of public money, nearly $350 million in today's currency, Hughes was summoned to a Senate committee investigating the project. Its chairman, Senator Owen Brewster, was on an immediate warpath. My answer is I don't remember. Now the man is well, taking down you there. Again. Him. Will you bring Mr. Mars in at the two o'clock session? Uh, I no, I don't think I will. Will you try to bring him in? No, I don't think I'll try. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it, and I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back. And I mean it. On November the first. 1947, the Spruce Goose or Flying Lumber Yard, as critics nicknamed the behemoth, conducted taxiing trials with approximately 40 reporters and engineers aboard. After several faster and faster taxi ones, with Hughes in the pilot seat, he unexpectedly called for 15 degrees flaps down, throttling up the eight-engine plane for its only time aloft. The Spruce Goose never flew again, but it remains to this day the biggest aircraft ever built. At Hughes' insistence, the plane was stored in a specially built climate-controlled hangar, entombed in mystery for the next 32 years, at an annual cost of $1 million. After Hughes passed away in 1976, the plane was put on display in Long Beach Harbor next to the Queen Mary, until she was moved to McMinnville, Oregon in 1993 where she resides at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum. And there you have it, the expensive flight of the Spruce Goose, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space. After cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space in 1961, 
Director of Cosmonaut Training, Nikolai Kakaman, read in an American media source that female pilots in the U.S. were training to become astronauts. As a result, Kakaman gained approval for an all-female cosmonaut program, which began training in 1963. Born on March 6, 1937, textile worker Valentina Tereshkova had no previous desire to fly in space. However, her love of skydiving made her an excellent candidate for the Soviet space program. Training included isolation tests, centrifuge g-force tests, thermo chamber tests, decompression chamber tests, and pilot training in MiG-15 fighter jets. On June 16, 1963, Tereshkova reached outer space in her Vostok 6 rocket after a flawless liftoff. Although she experienced nausea and physical discomfort for most of the flight, she orbited the Earth 48 times in just under three days, making her the first and only woman to solo in space. As was the protocol in all Vostok missions, Tereshkova ejected from her capsule during its descent at about four miles above the Earth, parachuting to the ground in Kazakhstan on June 19, 1963. After the dissolution of the first group of female cosmonauts in 1969, Tereshkova stayed on at the Soviet space program as an instructor, graduating from the Zhukovsky Air Force Engineering Academy and retiring from the Air Force in 1997, having attained the rank of Major General. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Tereshkova was elected in 2011 to the National State Duma much like the American House of Representatives, re-elected for a second term in 2016. And there you have it, Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Rosa Parks and the Montgomery Bus Boycott of 1955. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks was commuting home after a long day as a working seamstress, seated in the front row of the segregated blacks only back of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. When the front of the bus filled up with too many white passengers, driver J. Fred Blake asked Parks and three others to vacate their seats. And while the other riders complied, Parks had reached a tipping point in the segregated South. Refusing to give up her seat, she was promptly arrested and fined $14. Her arrest would trigger a second tipping point when black civil rights leaders and black bus riders alike kicked off a bus boycott demanding equal rights as American citizens. Upon her arrest, Parks phoned Edie Nixon, a prominent black leader, who bailed her out before convincing 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, to lead and inspire the first major civil rights protest in America. Roughly 40,000 black bus riders boycotted the Montgomery bus system beginning on December 5th, which represented 75% of all bus riders in the southern city of 120,000 residents. Initially, the protesters' demands did not include changing the segregation laws, but rather the group demanded courtesy, the hiring of black drivers, and a first-come, first-seated policy, with whites entering and filling the seats at the front of the bus, while blacks entered and sat in the rear. Ultimately, however, a group of five black Montgomery women affiliated with the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, sued the city, seeking to have busing segregation laws totally invalidated. As a result of Montgomery's bus boycott, on June 5, 1956, a Montgomery federal court ruled that any law requiring racially segregated seating violated the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was adopted after the Civil War and guaranteed all Americans, regardless of race, equal rights and equal protection under state and federal laws. The city of Montgomery appealed the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, which upheld the lower court's decision on December 20, 1956. The boycott ended the following day, 381 days after it began. And there you have it, 
Rosa Parks and the Montgomery Bus Boycott of 1955. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Barney Oldfield, the fastest man on earth. To his legion of fans, in the first two decades of the 20th century, Barney Oldfield's name became synonymous with speed and daring on racetracks across America. Born in 1878, Ohio, at the tender age of 16, Oldfield took up competitive bicycle racing, swiftly rising through the ranks to become a paid racer for Stern's Bicycle Company of Syracuse, New York. After competing in a gas-powered bicycle race in Salt Lake City, fellow racer Tom Cooper introduced Oldfield to Henry Ford who asked Oldfield to race one of two cars he had built specifically for the track. Despite Oldfield's complete lack of experience driving any type of car, in 1902 he traveled to Michigan to race the now famous number 999 car, but when neither experimental vehicle would start, Ford offered both test vehicles to Oldfield and Cooper for the staggering sum of $800. On June 20, 1903, Oldfield raced number 999 in a competition at the Indiana State Fairgrounds, where he became the first driver to run a mile track in one minute flat. Two months later, he covered the same distance in 55.8 seconds at the Empire City Racetrack in Yonkers, New York, galvanizing his fame as the fastest man on earth. In a nation intrigued by auto racing and feats of daring, Oldfield became a household name for the first two decades of the 20th century, winning eight major races in 49 tries. He retired from racing in 1918, marrying four times before passing away in Beverly Hills, California in 1946 at 68 years of age. And there you have it, Barney Oldfield, the fastest man on earth, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Ernest Shackleton survives the South Pole. Sailing from South Georgia Island for Antarctica on December 5, 1914, 27 men set out for the South Pole, hoping to establish a base on Antarctica's Weddell Sea coast. Two days later, the HMS Endurance entered the pack ice standing guard around the Antarctic continent, poking and prodding its way through leads in the ice until a January 18th northerly gale trapped the ship for the next 10 months to come. In the words of crewman Thomas Ord Lees, the endurance became frozen like an almond in the middle of a chocolate bar. Finally, on October 27, 1915, a new wave of pressure rippled across the ice, lifting the ship's stern and tearing off its rudder and keel, effectively crushing the ship's hull. Led by famed Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton, after salvaging what they could from the doomed ship, the crew's initial plan was to march across the ice toward land, but that was abandoned after the men managed just seven and a half miles in seven days. Camping on the ice until conditions improved, slowly and steadily their ice flow drifted farther to the north, until on April 7, 1916, the snow-capped peaks of Clarence and Elephant Islands came into view. Two days later, their ice raft broke apart, forcing the men to row in frigid conditions until they clambered ashore on Elephant Island. It would be the first time the men stood on dry land since leaving South Georgia 497 days earlier. After nine days of rest and recuperation, Shackleton and five others set out in one of Endurance's salvaged lifeboats, the James Caird, facing off with a 16-day voyage through monstrous swells and angry winds, bailing water and beating ice off the sails as they ventured 800 miles back to South Georgia Island. Blown off course by fearsome winds, Shackleton and two others set off on foot, climbing over mountains and sliding down glacier fields for 30 hours until they could reach help at the whaling station where they first departed. Meanwhile, the remaining crew hunkered down on Elephant Island, employing additional salvaged lifeboats to create what they called the snuggery, surviving the bitter cold with ever-diminishing hopes of being rescued. After two failed attempts to navigate through the flows of pack ice, Shackleton procured a third ship, the Yelko, and on August 30th, 1916, the saga of the Endurance and her crew came to an end. 
The men on the island were settling down to a lunch of boiled seal's backbone when they spied the Yelko just offshore. It had been 128 days since the James Caird had departed for help, ending 20 months of gutsy survival since the misadventure of the Endurance first began. And there you have it. Ernest Shackleton survives the South Pole, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Louis Zamperini survives the unimaginable. Born in 1917, Louis Zamperini was a tough kid out of Torrance, California. A smoker by age five, Louis was always getting into fights, while his favorite trick was stealing beer from bootleggers. When the chief of police and his high school principal tried to redirect the misguided youth into track and field, after a shaky start due to his long history of smoking, in 1934, Louis broke the world interscholastic mile record of 4 minutes 21 seconds, a record that would stand for the next two decades. Soon afterwards, the Torrance Tornado, as he was nicknamed, qualified for the 1936 Olympic Games, taking 8th place in the 5,000 meter race, but only after he ran the last quarter mile in just 56 seconds. The feat prompted a face-to-face -face meeting with Adolf Hitler, just three years before Nazi troops would blitzkrieg their way into Poland. After war broke out, Louis left USC and joined the Army Air Corps in the Pacific Theater, earning the nickname Lucky Louis after cheating death multiple times as a bombardier until his luck ran out on May 27, 1943. On a search and rescue mission 800 miles from land, his B-24 went down at sea, killing eight crew members but sparing Louis, the pilot Russell Phillips, and tail gunner Francis McNamara. The survivors floated in a life raft for 27 days, surviving on albatross meat and small fish, including the livers of small sharks they caught by hand. On the 27th day at sea, their luck turned south yet again, when they were spotted by Japanese fighters. The three men were strafed in a 30-minute assault, but thinking the castaways were dead, the Japanese finally left them alone. Miraculously, all three men had made it through the attack without a scratch. Six days later, McNamara passed away on their 33rd day adrift, and as bad luck would have it, on their 47th day, having drifted some 2,000 miles to the Marshall Islands, they were made prisoners of war by the Japanese. Louis weighed just 65 pounds, and after being transferred to Execution Island, so named because most prisoners of war that were taken there were executed by decapitation with a samurai sword. Louis and other Allied prisoners were abused daily and kept on a starvation diet. On three occasions, Louis was subjected to medical experiments, but after 47 days on Execution Island, Louis was transferred to a prisoner of war camp where he and others were horribly tortured by Mutsuhiro Watanabe, a.k.a. The Bird, an experience so horrifying that Louis still could not bring himself to talk about his experiences even 50 years after the war. After the Japanese tried to use his Olympic fame in a propaganda radio broadcast, Louis refused and was reassigned to a labor camp. Out of spite, the Japanese transferred The Bird to Louis's camp, where the torture would begin anew. Freed at war's end, Louis married a Miami socialite and began drinking heavily as a way to chase the bird and his memories of torture from his mind. With his marriage on the rocks, after his wife converted to Christ, Louis followed his wife's lead and converted as well. I made my confession of faith in Christ. I knew I'd forgiven them. I knew it. I knew I was too getting drunk, I was too smoking, and I had a whole new life now. And there you have it. The Torrance Tornado survives the unimaginable. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose. Andrew Carnegie, the story of a self-made man. Born in 1835 Dumfernline, Scotland, Andrew Carnegie was the son of an impoverished weaver family who emigrated to Western Pennsylvania in 1848 in search of a better life. At the tender age of 12, Andrew displayed his budding work ethic by taking a job as a bobbin boy, working 12 hours a day, six days a week for the Anchor Cotton Mills Company, earning the staggering wage of $1.20 a week, or $35 in today's currency. 
In 1849, after becoming an accomplished telegraph operator, Andrew's budding passion for education and reading was given a boost by Colonel James Anderson, who gave the young lad access to his personal library of over 400 volumes of books. The young prodigy was so grateful for the Colonel's generosity, obliging Carnegie to make a personal resolution that if his future endeavors ever made him a rich man, he would give back to society so that other poor boys could follow in his footsteps as a self-made man. By the age of 24, Carnegie landed a job as the superintendent of the Western Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which gave him the financial wherewithal to invest in growing companies. In 1864, Carnegie was one of the early investors in the Columbia Oil Company, which yielded over a million dollars in cash dividends in one year alone. The demand for iron weapons during the Civil War led Carnegie into the steel industry, which elevated him to industrialist stature by 1885. One of his two great innovations as a steel magnate was the adoption of the Bessemer process, which allowed the high carbon content of lesser grade pig iron to be forged into high grade steel. As a result of his innovation, steel prices plummeted, making his Bessemer steel the go-to source for the construction of rail lines, skyscrapers, and bridges. As a result, Carnegie Steel became the largest producer of steel in America, outputting more than 2,000 tons of high-grade steel per day. After selling Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan in 1901 for a whopping $304 million, Andrew Carnegie dedicated the last 18 years of his life to philanthropy, giving away over 90% of his wealth. With a net worth pegged at nearly $70 billion in today's currency, his contributions include Carnegie Hall in New York City and the Peace Palace or International Court of Justice in The Hague. He also founded the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which supported educational causes in the U.S and later the world, as well as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Carnegie Institution for Science, and the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland. He also created the Carnegie Hero Fund, which provided financial assistance and recognition for Americans and Canadians who had performed extraordinary acts of heroism in civilian life, while also founding Carnegie Mellon University and the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. And there you have it, Andrew Carnegie, a self-made man of the Gilded Age, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the TMC Dumont, a study in form, function, and design. Looking like something ripped out of a science fiction movie, Retired Formula One driver Tarso Marquis has created an incredibly sleek and low-profile motorcycle that sports an airplane engine with silver hubless wheels. Tarso's creation includes a 300-horsepower, six-cylinder Rolls-Royce Continental engine, widely used in aviation during the 1960s. While the engine draws the immediate attention of motorcycle enthusiasts, the wheels catch the attention of anyone who sees this most inventful of machines. Two massive 36-inch silver hubless wheels appear to be magically attached to the bike, giving the TMC Dumont an incredibly futuristic appearance. Adding to the outstanding performance of this machine of tomorrow is the bike's continuously variable transmission, or CVT a transmission design developed and manufactured uniquely for the Dumont. The CVT has no clutch or manual gear shifting, allowing the driver to simply roll the throttle to engage the bike, much like the operation of a scooter. The name Dumont is a tribute to Alberto Santos Dumont, who is a national hero in Brazil 
and believed by many Brazilians to have beaten the Wright brothers' historic 1903 flight at Kitty Hawk. How the bike drives on the street is a bit of a technological wonder, employing pivot points on the front suspension, which helps the rider navigate the bike through turns. While Tarso had conceived and continuously refined the Dumont for the preceding 15 years, the TMC Dumont made its debut at Daytona Bike Week 2018, where the futuristic machine won best in show over hundreds of competing motorcycles. And there you have it. Form, function, and design marry up in the TMC Dumont. Today in the Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose, Edmund Hillary, the first man to climb Mount Everest. After serving in World War II as a navigator for the Royal New Zealand Air Force, Edmund Hillary dedicated himself to his love of mountaineering, including the yet unachieved crown jewel of mountain climbing, a successful ascent of Mount Everest. In 1949, a long-standing route to the summit of Everest was closed by Chinese-controlled Tibet. While the Nepalese side of the mountain only allowed one or two expeditions a year, selected by the 9th British Expedition to Everest, team leader John Hunt tapped out Hillary to join the attempt. The expedition totaled over 400 people, including 362 porters, 20 Sherpa guides, and over 10,000 pounds of gear. The expedition set up base camp in March of 1953, working up the mountain to establish their final camp at South Col at 25,900 feet. On March 26, two climbers attempted the final ascent until their oxygen systems failed less than 300 vertical feet from the summit. Hunt then directed Hillary and Sherpa guide Tenzing Norgay to follow where the last two had failed. The two pitched a tent at 27,900 feet on May 28th, while their three-man support team returned down the mountain. The following morning, wearing 30-pound packs, the two climbers attempted the final ascent, until a 40-foot ice face approaching the summit nearly turned them back. Known today as the Hillary Step, Hillary later wrote that he noticed a crack between the rock and the snow sticking to the east face. He crawled inside and wiggled and jammed his way to the top. Tenzig followed behind him as Hillary chopped footholds for the two men to ascend the forbidden face. Then he saw that the ridge ahead dropped away to the north, while above him stood a snow dome. A few more whacks with his ice axe, and suddenly Hillary and Tenzing stood on the top of the world. Tenzig left chocolates at the summit as an offering to Hindu gods, while Hillary left a crucifix given to him by John Hunt. Their descent down the mountain was a treacherous one, since drifting snow had covered their tracks. When they finally made their way down to South Call, the first person they met was George Lowe. Well, George, said Hillary, we knocked the bastard off. Hillary would later go on to reach the South Pole in 1958, followed by the North Pole in 1985 in the company of Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. Hillary would be the first person to reach both poles, as well as the successful ascent of Everest. And there you have it, Edmund Hillary, the first man at the top of the world, today on The Daily Dose. Today in The Daily Dose, the forgotten genius of Charles Scott Sherrington, Considered the patriarch of the human central nervous system, Charles Scott Sherrington's life seems to have been lifted out of a 19th century boy's adventure novel. He played soccer for Ipwich Town while still in school, then laid down a distinguished rowing career while studying at Cambridge. After graduating in 1885, he studied bacteriology under the now famous Robert Koch, then began varied and quite seminal work on an extraordinary range of topics, including tetanus, diphtheria, bacteriology, hematology, cholera, and industrial fatigue. Along the way, he proposed the law of reciprocal innervation, which remains the best explanation to date on how muscles work. While studying the human brain, he coined the term synapse, which then led to the idea of proprioception which is the body's ability to know its own orientation in space, even with your eyes closed. His work on proprioception would lead to his discovery in 1906 of nociceptors, which are the nerve endings that alert an individual to pain. 
Sherrington's pioneering book on the subject entitled The Integrative Action of the Nervous System has been compared to Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica or William Harvey's Emoto Cordis, which in English means on the motion of the heart. Sherrington's unbounded qualities as a man of science and discovery didn't stop there. For everyone who had the privilege to encounter him came away with a sense of awe at his qualities as a human being. Among his students were future notables such as Wilder Penfield, who would become an authority on human memory, Howard Florey, who won a Nobel Prize for his role in developing penicillin, and Harvey Cushing, who went on to become one of America's most accomplished neurosurgeons. In 1925, Sherrington surprised even his closest friends when he published a book of poetry, while seven years later, he won the Nobel Prize for his work on reflexology. In 1940, at the age of 83, Sherrington hit the bestseller list with his book entitled Man on His Nature, which went through several editions and was later voted one of the top 100 books of modern Britain. And there you have it, the forgotten works of Charles Scott Sherrington, today on The Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose, Ben Franklin's Postal Service spawns an American Revolution. By the still tender age of 31, Ben Franklin had already built a prosperous business as a printer, shopkeeper, and publisher of the Pennsylvania Gazette, not to mention the author of the wildly successful Poor Richard's Almanac. In 1737, he was appointed postmaster of Philadelphia after British authorities removed his predecessor for failing to submit financial reports. Being a local postmaster didn't come with much pay, but it did allow Franklin to mail his newspaper to readers at no cost, making the Pennsylvania Gazette one of the colony's most successful publications. Comparable to how politicians and celebrities rely on platforms such as Twitter, Franklin used the mail for self-promotion of his many achievements making the Founding Father one of the world's most admired Americans. Due to his meticulous record-keeping, Franklin was asked by his British overlords to manage Britain's colonial mail service from 1753 to 1774, allowing Franklin to supercharge a primitive courier system connecting the 13 fragmented colonies into an efficiency-driven organization that sped deliveries between Philadelphia and New York City to a mere 24 hours. Franklin's travels along the post roads of colonial America would inspire his revolutionary vision for how a new nation could thrive independently of Britain. But not even Franklin could imagine the pivotal role his postal service would bring to the American Revolution. By the early 1770s, Franklin's fellow patriots had organized underground communication networks, the Committees of Correspondence, followed by the Constitutional Post, that allowed the Founding Fathers to talk treason behind the backs of their British rulers. In 1775, three months after the battles of Lexington and Concord, and well before the Declaration of Independence was even signed, the Continental Congress turned the Constitutional Post into the post office of the United States, whose operations became the first, and for many average Americans, the most significant function of the newly formed government. James Madison and other founding fathers understood how the post could support a fledgling democracy, delivering inexpensive newspapers and political pamphlets that shed light on British tax bills designed to pay back Britain after her defense of the colonies during the French and Indian Wars. Put simply, Franklin's efficient management of the world's first social media platform allowed like-minded Americans to join forces in their common desire for independence. And there you have it. Franklin's Postal Service spawns an American revolution. Today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Albert Schatz, The Biggest Loser in Scientific Discovery. After Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin in 1928, the world of science and medicine still had no defense against gram-negative bacterias. 
responsible for the likes of tuberculosis, bubonic plague, cholera, typhoid fever, and other penicillin-resistant diseases. Albert Schatz ended that deficiency in 1943, working as a postgraduate assistant under the supervision of Selman Waxman, who led the Soil Microbiology Department at Rutgers College of Agriculture. In search of a gram-negative antibiotic, Schatz followed a hunch that became the most important microbiological breakthrough of the 20th century. After Schatz discovered the first two strains of the gram-negative antibiotic streptomycin, Waxman immediately saw the potential of Schatz's discovery. He took full control of all clinical trials, making the 23-year-old understudy sign an agreement which ceded all patent and royalty rights to Rutgers. Waxman would go on to take full credit for the discovery of streptomycin, as well as a Nobel Prize in 1952, never once in his life accrediting Schatz as the true source of the breakthrough. When Schatz discovered that Waxman was receiving a royalty for streptomycin, to the tune of $3.8 million in today's money, Schatz sued Waxman and Rutgers and won an out-of-court settlement for $120,000 and 3% of the royalties for several years to follow. But the move ruined his career in academia, forcing him to accept teaching roles in a small agriculture college in Pennsylvania. His papers were routinely rejected by leading science journals, and when he wrote his account of what really happened regarding the discovery of streptomycin, the only journal willing to publish his account was the Pakistan Dental Review. Twenty years after Waxman's death, the American Society for Microbiology invited Schatz to address their annual meeting on the 50th anniversary of streptomycin's discovery, ironically bestowing him with the Society's highest honor, the Selman A. Waxman Medal. Life sometimes can be enormously unfair. And there you have it, Albert Schatz, the biggest loser in scientific discovery, today on The Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose, Woodrow Wilson hallucinates at the Paris Peace Conference. During the Spanish pandemic of 1918, like other presidents before and since his administration, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson attempted to downplay the disease as the deadly pathogen spread to every corner of the globe. Citing key evidence from Wilson's papers, Presidential historian Tevi Troy called Wilson the worst U.S. president in terms of handling a disaster. Troy writes in his book entitled, Shall We Wake the President? Two Centuries of Disaster Management from the Oval Office. The federal response to the influenza outbreak in 1918 can best be described as neglectful. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died without President Wilson saying anything or mobilizing non-military components of the U.S. government to help the civilian population. In April of 1919, while sailing to the Big Four peace talks in Paris, Wilson and many of his staff contracted Spanish flu, including Wilson's daughter Margaret, several members of his Secret Service detachment, Wilson's stenographer and his chief usher. While the Big Four were trying to resolve questions concerning German reparations, the creation of the League of Nations and the threat of Bolshevism, Wilson's hallucinatory response to the flu and its associated high fever severely jeopardized the outcome of the talks. As the president's illness worsened, key aides became alarmed when the normally predictable Wilson began to blurt out unexpected orders. On one occasion, the president created a scene over pieces of furniture that had suddenly disappeared in his suite room, even though nothing about the furnishings had been moved. The president further became convinced that he was surrounded by French spies. We could but surmise that something queer was happening in his mind, Chief Usher Erwin Hoover later recalled. One thing was certain, Hoover goes on, Wilson was never the same after his little spell of sickness. Wilson's shift in mentation would forever impact the outcome of the Paris Peace Conference and ultimately the Treaty of Versailles. For while Wilson's initial stance was that the winners of World War I should go easy on Germany to facilitate a lasting peace, after coming down with influenza, 
Wilson conceded to the other world leaders' demands, setting the stage for a settlement so harsh and onerous to Germans that it became the leading rallying call for a revitalized German nationalism, the rise of Adolf Hitler, and the advent of World War II. And there you have it. Spanish flu destroys a sitting president's mind. Today in the Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose. An African slave brings smallpox relief to the American colonies. In the early 1700s, almost a century before Edward Jenner gave birth to the concept of vaccination, smallpox outbreaks raged in recurrent waves throughout the American colonies. In Massachusetts alone, Bostonians saw smallpox arrive in foreign cargo ships on a regular basis. Yet authorities could do little more than quarantine those suspected of exposure while treating those who were actively sick. That all changed thanks to the wisdom passed on from Onesimus, an African slave purchased by influential Boston minister, author, and pamphleteer Cotton Mathers, who purchased Onesimus back in 1706. Made famous for his direct involvement in the Salem witch trials of 1692 to 1693, Mathers took sincere interest in Onesimus as a man and frequently conversed with him on a broad range of topics. During what would become the worst smallpox outbreak in Boston's history, in 1721, when nearly half of Boston's population was stricken by the disease, Mathers asked Onesimus if he had ever had smallpox back in Africa. Onesimus responded by telling Mathers about the practice of variolation, which was widely practiced by Africans and Asians at the time to control the transmission of infectious diseases. Onesimus went on to explain how physicians would collect discharge from the open sores of smallpox patients, delivering a small amount of exudate into an incision made on a healthy person's arm, thereby stimulating that person's immune system to sufficiently defend itself against an all-out exposure to the smallpox virus known today as variola major. Mathers began researching variolation, soon discovering that the practice was so effective in conferring immunity that African slaves sold in Massachusetts at the time were deemed to be more valuable if they bore the scar of variolation. When Mathers proposed variolation to the Boston public at large, pushback was swift and oftentimes personal as townsfolk accused Mathers of tampering with God's judgment. That is until physician Zabdiel Boylston inoculated his own son and the slaves in his possession. When the good doctor shared his results, one death out of 40 patients, opposed to one death out of seven in the unvariolated general public, Puritan Bostonians began to shelf the religious dogma in favor of the added protection of smallpox variolation. And there you have it. Onesimus sheds wisdom on the American colonies. Today on The Daily Dose, get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com.